welcome. I'm going to suggest we get started, especially because uh, the first thing is if you would like to follow along, you're going to need to pull out your device and log into the web page. And actually, it's, it's just our regular Shenandoah Hall web page. If you're not interested in following along, that's fine. But I want you to know that the presentation that is being displayed here is posted on the web page. It is an open link for anyone to view. And all you need to do is go to the, um, uh, from the home page, you go to the academics page, or, which is across the top now, where the schools used to be across the top. Now you see the academics. Scroll to the very bottom of that page, and you'll see the presentation. And it's right there for you, and you can follow along screen by screen if you so choose. If you prefer just to be an auditory listener, you are welcome to do that as well. And maybe you want to make a note to check in on it when you get home tonight, and that would be fine. And we will leave that posted there as well. So I'm Elizabeth Wood, Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction and Assessment here in Shenandoah. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. I will start off by introducing our administrators who are actually um, out milling about, some of them helping direct folks in, some passing out note cards. So we have Rose Barra, who is our K-5 Math and Science Academic Administrator. We have Kathleen Strangis, who's passing out note cards in the back. She is in charge of K-5 ELA and Social Studies. Carrie Peverly, who is over here, she is 612 Math. Jean Lorch, standing in the back, is 612 Science. Lisa Kissinger could not be with us this evening. However, on this presentation, we have links to all of the um, email addresses for all of our administrative team. Certainly, if you have any follow-up questions specific for Ms. Kissinger, she, would, she will be monitoring her email. She's excellent with email and would get right back to you. Uh, and Kathy Sherwin is also here. She is our 612 English, or ELA supervisor, um, academic administrator, grades 6 through 12. So just to give you an overview of what to expect tonight, first of all, we will have done our job well if we are done with talking to you in 30 minutes. We are hoping to really walk through our section in a, a, as concise a manner as possible, and then allowing opportunities for question and answer, which is why the note cards are being passed out now. What we will do is if something comes to your mind and you think I would really like to ask this question, you're invited to write it on the note card. We'll collect the note cards. We'll sort through the questions that we think are most pertinent to the largest number of people uh, we will address this evening. And also know that even if we don't address your question, we intend to stay around for a while after and you will be able to find the individual who you think will best answer the question you may have. So we. Our intention this evening is to give you an overview of the academic program. And we start with that so you have a broad understanding of what we anticipate is the academic program for all children. And then we will go into the specific honors and acceleration opportunities because we want to make a clear distinction that the academic program that we've designed for all students really does meet the needs of the vast, vast majority of our students. And so we want to start um, from that vantage, sharing that information with you. Then we go into the honors and accelerated opportunities. We then at the end will talk very briefly about how we will communicate with you and where you can find additional information when the time rolls around that, it, that we would be having conversations with you related to honors or enrichment or acceleration opportunities for your child. And then as I indicated at the end, there will be a time for questions. Good evening. One of the goals for Shenandoah Schools is to prepare all our students for college and career. Now more than ever, that is a very interesting task. This generation of students that are in our schools before us are different than any generation that has come before. In the generations that came before, we provided our students with opportunities to get a skill set that they can then apply to a college and then to a career. If we did that now, if we just did that now, we would be setting our students up for obsolescence. It's very important that we recognize that the future is moving faster and faster all the time, 
and we have no way of predicting the career opportunities that our children that are before us now will be offered to them at the other side of college. We do know that every, college, every student that leaves Shenandoah has to have with them two very important things. The first is very strong content knowledge across all curricular areas. On the other side, they have to have that flexibility in problem solving so that they can apply that strong contact knowledge to future problems that we can't even predict. And that really is a thread through the curriculum from elementary through high school to kind of tie together strong content knowledge and flexibility in problem solving so that we provide the springboard our students need for the future. One of the things I hear more and more at many levels and in, across many curricular areas is inquiry, open-ended problem solving, opportunities for our students to take what they've learned and apply it to something new and novel. So in the world of math, um, all of the concepts and skills that we teach students in kindergarten through eighth grade are important to themselves, but they really are creating a very important foundation for our students to be able to be successful in algebra when they get to ninth grade or seventh or eighth grade if they're accelerated students. In turn, that important foundation in algebra is then important for everything that comes after that. If you take a look at this question, this was Question number two on the June 2015 Common Core Algebra exam. This was on the first administration of the exam just over a year, about a year ago. Question number two. And what this means is that every student in New York State is expected to be able to answer this question. There's a couple of things to notice about the question, things that perhaps are different than what we remember when we were in school. One, it's a very high level of rigor in terms of the reading level. A lot of words to read and understand before you can even access the math that's in this problem. The other thing to notice is that there's many layers to understanding before you can answer this problem as well. It's not just a single concept or skill that a student needs to have or understand. There's many things going on here to be able to answer that question correctly. Many, many questions are like this, and this is what we are teaching students now, is to really understand at a very deep level the math that they're, that they're learning. It's no longer just memorizing, um, and some students might get to it, and some students might learn it. It really is math for all. It's important to note, too, as we look at the program, um, that we're, and you're gonna see this in a little bit, but there's many different levels that we use to support students to be able to do this kind of work. spoke to the math part, <clears throat> I'd like to speak to a little bit about that foundation part. You see here a visual representation of building blocks. And we do that purposely because we believe here at Shenandoah that in order to create a strong structure, you need to start with a very strong base. Would you agree? So we start that very strong base as early as kindergarten. That thinking that's required, I'll speak to it in English specifically, we start spiraling those skills and as I said in kindergarten, with incremental difficulty and age appropriateness, it's important to meet the child where they are, but it's also important to stretch them. And so we start very early identifying these levels and these critical skills, all while we're working and building a very tall structure in preparation for middle school and for high school. Having said that, we talk about reading and engaging with text. We're not just talking about the process of reading, but the process of thinking and building strong thinking skills. So those critical skills that will be very important both in those algebra problems and as well in the upper grades for English, like making inferences or understanding the main idea or thinking about comparing and contrasting different stories, different texts, and a great deal of informational texts as well. We also teach that the importance of relevance so very early on when I went to school, yes, we identified those important characters and those important traits and the setting and the plot and all those great themes, but we also now have to understand the relevance. Why is it important to think that way? And that becomes very crystal, crystal clear as we move towards the middle school and the high school and start talking about high school English. 
I'm going to pass it over to Mrs. Sherman for you. <coughs> Hello. So Ms. Strand just talked about how ele our elementary program is providing the foundation for skills in reading, writing, listening, speaking, and thinking. The Common Core Regents exam is now the benchmark of college and career readiness in English. And this is the version of the English Regents exam that all students must now take and pass in order to graduate. The Common Core version of this test is a lot more challenging than the comprehensive test that students have been taking up until now. Um, this test is one-third reading comprehension and two-thirds writing. The reading comprehension passages range in genre. There's fiction, there's nonfiction, there's poetry. All of the writing that students do is based on text as well. In fact, um, there are eight texts total that students need to read and analyze while they're taking this three-hour test. Just to go back to the writing piece a little bit, um, I want you to understand the complexity of what students need to accomplish within the three hours. The first essay that students write is a text-based argument essay. It is based on four nonfiction texts. Students have to read all four texts, choose three, and use relevant evidence from the three texts that they've chosen to build an argument in response to a prompt. The final essay is a literature response essay, also based on a piece of text, where students need to analyze the theme and the author's craft in the piece of writing. So very, very challenging, requires a lot of cognitive skills for students. Um, and the texts themselves are incredibly challenging. Um, the lexile is the way that we measure um, text complexity. The average lexile of the eight texts that are on this test is a 1255, which is, in our language, a grade 11, 12 level text. But if you look at the range of lexiles of these eight texts, they range from eighth grade reading up through beyond grade 12, so college and adult level as well. So students really have to be able to comprehend at a very deep level. to share with you one example of, one of, of a multiple choice question from the Common Core English Regents, just so that you could get a sense of the cognitive, cognitive demand of this type of question. First of all, this multiple choice question is based on an excerpt from The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton. That is a classic text that was written in 1920. Um, the context and the setting and the time period, the references in that text are all classic references, not necessarily always relevant to the students who are reading it, but yet they've got to be able to read this excerpt, make meaning of it, and then answer a question which asks them to understand a variety of literary um, things, liter literary concepts. For instance, they need to know what a flashback is, they need to be able to go back to a section of the text, lines two through 23, understand how flashback functions in that, and then choose the best option which answers the question. And please notice, every single choice for the, for the, to answer this question includes the name of a character from the text. Very, very difficult for kids. Multiple skills there. Tracking back to text, analysis, understanding of content, and then the ability to choose the answer that is the best answer. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Barra, who's going to discuss our honors and accelerated offerings. Thank you. So up until this point, we've been talking and sharing information about the expectations for all of our students. We do recognize that there are students that need more, something above and beyond what we've been talking about thus far. We recognize that all kids develop at their own pace. And so we try as best as we can to provide opportunities for our students to participate in acceleration and enrichment opportunities at different points in their educational career. 
The rest of this presentation will be focused on the enrichment and acceleration opportunities that we have at Shenandoah from the elementary through 12th grade, looking at the progressions in each one of the four core content areas. At the elementary level, we have two opportunities, one for enrichment and one acceleration, and that is our Quest program and our Math Acceleration program. And incidentally, this week, we begin the process. At about mid-third grade year, we assess our students using a cognitive abilities test. This is a test which assesses three levels of ability, learned ability, verbal reasoning, nonverbal reasoning, and quantitative reasoning. And the percentile rankings of those tests gives us an indication of those students that may be working at or above their grade level. This becomes a diagnostic and one piece of data that we use for determination of those students that will do well in either of these two programs. The Quest program is a one-day pull-out program offered to our fourth and fifth graders. Because it's a one-day pull-out program, it presents a problem that's kind of twofold. And we have to be very careful uh, to guard against this. Sometimes we have students that just love being immersed in that problem-based learning opportunity that they get in Quest at the expense of what they're missing in the classroom, not being there that fifth day. On the other hand, we sometimes have students that are doing very, very well in their fourth or fifth grade classroom, but aren't developmentally ready for the sentence structure and the depth of knowledge that's expected of them in the Quest program. So in addition to the COGATs, we look at other data to help us find those students that won't have the difficulty on either end and will thrive both in their classroom and in the Quest program. So we look at things like their quarterly writing samples. We look at how they do on common English language arts assessment. We look at how they do on their reading levels and take all of this into consideration when we determine which students qualify for the Quest program. The COGAD assessment is also the first step for math acceleration. We take a look here at the quantitative battery of tests and look at the percentile rankings to help identify those students that may benefit from math acceleration. At the elementary level, math acceleration means skipping over a grade level of math. So here too, we have to be very careful and make sure we are picking those students that can handle skipping over an entire year of content. So in addition to the COGATs, we look at some other data points. One is the test for gifted students in mathematics to look in more in depth at the critical thinking skills in math that our students have. This test is very different from the COGAD. It's not a bubble test. It's a booklet test where the students actually show their reasoning to a variety of problem-solving um, things that they will be exposed to. From those two pieces, we can look further and match how they're doing in the classroom by getting teacher input. We look at the common assessments that the students take through the year. We also would look at the end of the year test for the grade level that they'll be skipping just to make sure that they're ready as a fourth grader to take fifth grade math and as a fifth grader to take sixth grade math. The fifth grade program is delivered within the schools by a fifth grade teacher. The fourth grader would match his math time with the fifth grade teacher so that he could go across the hall to take the class. The sixth grade program is taught by a traveling teacher who goes from site to site to site to deliver a consistent sixth grade math honors program and prepare them for middle school. So now I'll turn it over to Ms. Peverly to continue the story of math in middle school. As a parent, you have access to all of our progressions documents. They are extremely helpful in, in um, helping you make the best choices you can for your child as they progress through their education. And we want to show you how you can access these because they are available to you on the district website. You can access the progressions documents by clicking on the academic page of the district website. You will see all of the, the disciplines are listed, and you can click on any one 
and it will open and give you a wealth of information about that particular program. I wanted to share with you a little bit of information about our English program. First of all, um, let me just share with you that the document has multiple levels for every curricular area. We have honors programming, grade level programming, and accelerated programming. And though these progressions may look fixed, they are not. They are flexible based on a child's readiness and a child's academic needs and there are multiple entry points along the way into honors or accelerated programming for a child who is ready for a greater challenge. And I can say, for the English program particularly, we have um, courses at every level that offer the appropriate choice for each learner. Um, honors and accelerated programming begins in English at grade seven. We uh, do our honors and acceleration recommendation jointly with social studies. Students who are accelerated in English and in social studies take a combined year of that course, English in this particular case, English 7-8 in one year, and then students move on to English 9 honors, and they take that as an eighth grader at the middle school, and 9 honors therefore becomes their first credit-bearing high school course and they're taking it before they get to High School West. So when students leave the middle school with that one credit of English under their belt, they move to High School West and take um, World Culture, World Literature together, which is an interdisciplinary social studies and English class that really speaks to the unity of history, art, and literature. It's a humanities course. From there, when students enter the high school, and really this is any student at this point, the variety of courses really opens up and students can take really what they're interested in and what they're ready for. There is no course in the secondary English program that a child can't access if he or she is not accelerated. And at this point, I will turn it over to Mrs. Peverly, who will talk more about math. So this hopefully shows you that there's many different ways for students to progress through math um, and to be successful. Um, these are typical progressions. So again, we did not put all of the different arrows in to show you every possible pathway that a student could take. But these are typical pathways. And what you'll notice along the left-hand side is that we have, again, regents level courses. That's your typical algebra in ninth grade, geometry in 10th grade, algebra two in 11th grade, and then pre-calculus. Um, we also have single acceleration. We have double acceleration. Um, single acceleration being a student taking a course a year prior to when most of his or her peers are taking that. Um, double acceleration two years prior. And we even once in a while have a student that is triple accelerated. Um, taking that three years prior to most of his or her peers. Again, in the Regents level, we are doing things with students that we used to reserve just for honors level or accelerated students. So the Regents level pathway really is a very rigorous course for students to progress through. In the world of honors, it is content level. It's the same, so if it's algebra honors, for instance, it's still algebra, but it goes a little bit faster, a little bit deeper, more problems, more interesting types of things that students could get into. In acceleration, many students do accelerate starting in elementary, um, moving from fourth to fifth grade. Again, recognizing that students progress and develop at different levels, we do have other opportunities at the middle school for students to accelerate there as well. Students may not accelerate moving from fifth into sixth grade if they haven't already been accelerated. And the reason for that is we know that the math that is in sixth grade really does have very, a very important foundation for students um, for all the math that they'll take from that point on. So we don't want students skipping over math six. We want students taking that course to get that really good foundation. What we do instead is we recognize that some students moving from sixth to seventh grade may need to accelerate at that point. And again, instead of skipping over courses, what we do is we compact courses instead. So for students who have not been accelerated up to the point that they get to middle school, 
They would take all of seventh grade and part of eighth grade in seventh grade, and then finish eighth grade and all of algebra in eighth grade. So what we're really doing is taking three years of math and compacting it, compacting it into two years. Students can also double accelerate, and what that looks like is they would have accelerated five going, I'm sorry, four going five, and then again, five going six. So the compacted courses that I just described would happen for those students in sixth and seventh grade, with them taking geometry as an eighth grader. And again, that would, that would be for double accelerated. There's different reasons to accelerate, and there's really, in, in my mind, there's, there's two reasons to accelerate. There's a short-term reason and a long-term reason. And the short-term one is, is the, the most immediate and most important one in the sense that if a student needs to be challenged, that's the first reason to accelerate a student. If they're bored, if they know a lot of the material already, if they are ready for that faster pace, that's the first reason to accelerate a student. They need the challenge. There's a need for them to remain um, loving math and really interested in the subject area. The long-term reason, which is really secondary, is that for students who do accelerate, either single or double acceleration, they will get to a point where they can take calculus as either a junior or a senior. All right, so in other words, if a student does not accelerate, then calculus is not an option at that, for that student. All right, but again, the most immediate, most important reason to accelerate is that a student needs the challenge then, then and there. I do want to also point out that um, we do have students who, for whatever reason, do not accelerate prior to, um, to going into the high school. And once they start high school, and if they've not been accelerated, they do need to take Algebra, Geometry, and Algebra II. Um, those, again, are very important regents level uh, foundational courses. And so for a student who may want to take calculus as a senior and is ready to do so, there, are, there is an option for those students, and that is to take pre-calculus during the summer between their junior and senior year. So again, not expecting to necessarily remember all of those options, but to know that there are options, that there are definitely different pathways and different entry points into the world of math and into what you're seeing here in this progressions chart. I would also encourage you, in the lower left-hand corner, and actually there's three links along the bottom, I would encourage you to take a look at these, but particularly the one to the left when you get a chance. What it is, and you'll see it on every progressions chart, and that is what we call a profile of a Regents level um, versus an honors versus an accelerated student. And it's not to say that every student fits that profile exactly, but it does start the conversation and the thinking about the kind of student that would be best suited or best challenged in each of those different levels. And so if you're thinking that you have a child that may need one of those levels or the other to be challenged, I would suggest you take a look at that and also to talk to your child's teacher um, about their thoughts as far as what they see in terms of what your child needs at that time. Okay, I'm almost last, but certainly not least, uh, talking about science. And it makes sense that science would come now in the presentation because if you think about science, um, in order to be successful in science, you really need to be able to read, write, and apply mathematics. So science is the application and the intersection of all three of those skills and content areas that you've already heard about. Um, I will say no matter what level uh, your child is in, they will experience a very rigorous program in science all the way through. So again, what you'll see is the progressions. I will uh, reiterate a lot of what you've already heard. There is no uh, one pathway that students take. There are many different ways that students access all of these courses. Um, the acceleration pathway starts in grade eight. We do not have any honors classes in the middle school. Uh, one of the reasons for that is because New York State right now is in the process of accepting, uh, potentially accepting a new curriculum, so which is incredibly rigorous. It involves uh, the integration of the engineering strands in science, so all by itself it will uh, increase the rigor of the program in the middle school. So we are not going to develop any honors program at the middle school, at least not yet, until we see how students uh, accept and, and start to actually uh, master the new curriculum. Uh, with that said, I will say that there, again, there are students who need 
in addition to that level of rigor, they need more. So we do start in grade eight uh, with acceleration pathway. They can take uh, honors earth science in grade eight. That pathway then goes to biology honors in grade nine, chemistry honors or AP in grade 10, and physics in grade 11, and then some level of an elective at the senior year. I will also say that it's absolutely crucial for you to understand that we do not accelerate students in science without accelerating in math. So that's a key, key element that you should walk away with tonight. Uh, the reason for that is you might be thinking about it doesn't really impact them in earth science or biology. That's true. However, our longitudinal studies of our most successful and uh, most capable students in our science program is that if they do not accelerate in math, then when they hit chemistry in grade 10, they are not successful. Not as successful as they should be um, as our most capable students. So we have developed our program to be absolutely certain that only the students who accelerate in math are invited to accelerate in science. So that's an important distinction. Um, beyond that, I will also share that there at any time, students uh, will gain access to any one of these courses. We do recommend strongly, if not use the word require, students to come out of high school with at least some level of earth science, biology, chemistry, and physics. Even if they don't accelerate, many of them do actually double up in the senior year, um, you know, when they have more options in their schedule in terms of timing. And if they know that they want to pursue a, a engineering or some level of, of pre-med or things like that in, in college, I want to say about 68% of our students who are enrolled in AP Biology right now are dual enrolled in physics. So please don't think that if, you, if your child doesn't accelerate in grade eight that the door is closed. It's not closed. It means just they're just going to be a different way that they're going to complete the program. Uh, but the doors are open, the arrows you know, are, are every which way, it just depends on the uh, readiness and interest of your child. And I think last but not least is social studies. Which actually is apropos because in my past life I was a social studies teacher at the high school. Um, I, I will actually just show you how to access, I think, I think you've got the hang of this now, right? We have progressions for every single content area, 612. If you go down the list, you'll actually even get to progressions for physical education and technology and business. And we have done this to make it easier for families to understand what the choices are. But in doing so, what we don't want is this idea that it is completely rigid because that is not the case. There are a few additional things that I want you to walk away with tonight. One is that a link off of the academic page will take you to where we outline criteria for acceleration. And we've talked about all of the options, but there is a very specific profile for students who fit acceleration. There's also a very specific profile for learners for honors. And we have clearly spelled that out. It is listed here as are the timelines for when we would be notifying you or when we are doing testing internally. One thing that I, I would feel very remiss if, if I didn't take some time to talk about, and I'm sorry it means I'm talking a little bit longer than I hoped we were tonight. We, we started off by talking about the uh, rigors of our academic program. Uh, our, I have to say I'm very proud of the academic program here in Shenandoah for all children. And, and I say this prior to the job I have now, I was an elementary principal for 10 years in two different districts. I have seen so much progress over, over I guess now my 15 years as an administrator at those, those levels, how we engage students in their learning. We, ha we had work to do as, as an educational system, and I'm talking about the, the best suburban schools had work to do. We had too many kids that were bored in our standard academic program. That has lessened significantly with the you know, major reform movements, and, and you can think what you want about them, and we all have our own opinions about it, but one thing that is for sure is that students have a greater opportunity to be more intellectually engaged in their learning, and that is something to celebrate, and I can tell you, I see far fewer students who are bored to tears in classrooms doing worksheet after worksheet, and that is a blessing for every kid. 
The other, the other takeaway from that is that means that that level of programming is appropriate for the vast majority of our students. And what I don't want you to walk out, it, it feel like if your child, you're not sure he or she fits that profile like that, that's a problem. It's not a problem. I, I can say, you know, even when I look at our administrative team, and we're, we're in this stuff all of the time, some of our children might go on and choose an honors course or an, an accelerated course, and some may not. And it, it does not, and I need you to pause here and think about this for a minute, because we, as we're, we're all parents, right? And we, we think we want the best for our children, but we can get very caught up in this notion that he or she isn't reaching their fullest level of success if they don't accelerate or partake in honors. Let me tell you, as a district, we would like your child, and we'd say 50 to 60% of our high school students take at least one honors or one AP class. It is okay if you don't feel that that is right for your child. It is okay. Maybe have the conversation, look at the program of studies, and choose one honors course or one AP course that is calling your child. In fact, we would encourage you, unless you have a child who is absolutely exceptional. I don't know if you saw my face when Mrs. Peverly was talking about the double math accelerated, the triple math accelerated. They, wonderful, amazed me, right? They, I, they, I hope that they're the ones doing great things in the world. They are gonna be filling jobs that I have no interest in filling, um, and maybe some of you as well, it's fabulous. But that is, not, that is not the norm. And kids who don't participate in that will leave with a wonderful diploma from Shenandoah and will go on and have terrific career options. So I, I just don't want you to walk out feeling as though there's tremendous pressure to do it. It's great, and, and we would like, in the confines of Shenandoah, your child to be challenged. Because we would rather that they stumble, when it's free for you, right, and non-credit bearing at the college level, very good, and when mom and dad are there to say, mm-mm-mm, -mm -mm. I know I just came up with a contract with my son at home so I would stop nagging him because I really just couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> I think I was trying to help him, but it was really to help me. Um, so, uh, you know, there, are, do it now, challenge yourself, but also, no, th this, this does not define long-term success, right? Think about the, the people who've gone on and have the most successful, what, what, however you define success, and I, we define it, we all define it differently, but there is no one set path for success. And there's no one set profile or no one set body of knowledge students need to get into even the most prestigious colleges. So as we lay this out, and we are very proud of our academic program, and we are very proud of the complexities and all of the options and all of the honors and all of the acceleration, and know that your child's EQ, his or her ability to interact with others, to follow through on commitment, and to be a great human being are always number one in our book, all right? So I just I felt like we were being very heavy on the, and you can accelerate, and you can accelerate. Um, and sometimes missing the, the larger picture of, of what we do in schools and also a very critical part of why we have a public education system in our nation. So um, we are going to collect your Q&A cards in the event that you have questions we have not answered. And I'll just do a quick sort through and we'll see if we can answer any of those <coughs> while we're talking. I also want to note, or while I'm here at the mic still, I also want to note at the end of the presentation, if you've pulled out your phone and connected and gone to the academic page, and like I said, on the, from the academic page, when you scroll all the way to the bottom, actually, Mrs. Barrett's great here, she'll show you actually how to do it. Scroll to the bottom, you're going to see the presentation posted. The very last slide of the presentation is a survey for you. Because I can tell you, this is maybe the third or fourth time these lovely ladies have worked with me to present this presentation, and every year we've changed it, and every year we don't know if we get it right for the audience we're delivering it to. So we think, oh, we wanna show them all of the options. Well, we show you all the options that may seem overwhelming. We don't show you enough options and think, well, I already knew about that, I already, I already knew. So here's an opportunity to give us some feedback about what you came hoping for, and did you get a taste of that at all tonight? And while we can't go back and undo tonight's presentation, we can assure you that we will take your feedback into consideration and, and make something that is more relevant for our folks next year.
All right, the first question. My daughter is in seventh grade. Is her ability to enter honors programming cur curtailed because of this? Not at all. Actually, honors is, it, it, it's, I say relatively open, um, particularly as you enter the high school. If, so say your child is regular uh, regents track, fabulous, just like the vast majority of students. The question is, are we closed out of honors options? Absolutely not, particularly when you get to high school west, high school east, your child will review the course program. If your child, and, and really sit with your child and go through where we've posted the profile of an honors student, talk to your child about that and say, is this you? And, and if I were you, I would set your criteria and say, I would like you, minimally, to choose one honors level or AP course. That that's your bare minimum. Some of you are probably going to have children who you would like to have do much more. Okay, and, and you know your, your child. Have the conversation, is this the course? Is this the course where you're willing to put in more time and effort? Because I can tell you, and I, I will say right now, at our high school, we have a few students who are, are too overloaded. So one or two, great, honors AP. But we also, and we have some students who can handle taking every single AP, but that it, there are the small, small, it's very hard to think that that's the right thing for the vast majority of our kids. It really is too much. AP, if, it, raise your hand, Did you, who took an AP class in here? You know, you, you already know, I don't even need to tell you this. It's a tremendous amount of content put into a very short period of time with a very rigorous examination at the end of it. All right, talking about time frames for when we review students for the upcoming year, it really starts about now. As Mrs. Barra said, we are administering the COGATS right now at the elementary. When we get that information back, we will share that information with you. We will let you know how your child did and how that shakes out relative to Quest. And also, you know, I know, and trust me, we get a lot of phone calls of not too happy people uh, when the child doesn't make uh, Quest. I can say we have a very high cut point for that, and your child may not be participating in Quest, however, may go on to middle school and high school and absolutely participate in all sorts of uh, rigorous academic programming. In, in terms of middle school, again, we're looking at common assessment information now. We're looking at, in some cases, New York State scores. I mean, we've got students who are getting near perfect scores, high fours on New York State. I mean, that's telling that they're ready for something else. We, we give these common assessments internally in Shenandoah because we can tell the students who are performing at the very top percentiles. So we're going through that assessment data and beginning that process of identification of students really now and it will go through the next maybe six weeks or so. Uh, can students start in grade six with world languages? Uh, no, we start our world languages program in grade seven. If you had an exceptional situation, like uh, your child was already um, maybe fluent in a second language at home but didn't know how to read or write, we could probably have that conversation with you, but typically the, the pathway for world languages starts in grade seven. Uh, grade five accelerated math. Okay, grade five accelerated math. Is this the same content as regular grade six math? in middle school, essentially yes, it's, it's the sixth grade honors class, they're just doing it a year early. Oh boy, it's going to humble me, potential need for glasses. <laughs> One for the Here, can you read that one? Seriously. Actually, all right, while I'm sorting through, Mrs. Sherman, do you want to come talk about critical inquiry reading for grade six and the process to get into this class? Sure. You're certainly the most knowledgeable person here on that. Critical inquiry is a grade six enriched reading class. We do not consider it honors programming. It is not an accelerated class, and critical inquiry is not required for a child to move into honors and accelerated programming in English in grade seven when we begin honors and accelerated programming. Critical inquiry, um, as I said, is a sixth grade reading course designed for those students who are very skilled as readers uh, and as speakers and even as writers because they're responding to texts all the time. The course is uh, focused around the Socratic seminar model 
So students are reading text, they are making meaning from it, they are coming prepared to participate in a seminar style discussion with their peers, often leading, certainly piggybacking off of one another. It's a very high level literacy skills course. In order to qualify for critical inquiry, we really are looking at a very small percentage of our sixth graders. The majority of our sixth grade students take reading six, which is also a challenging course designed to help get students ready for honors and accelerated programming. And reading six also does incorporate some of the aspects of Socratic seminar that critical inquiry is based on. So critical inquiry, um, we are very selective as to the students that we recommend for that enriched program. It is based on multiple things. We look at scores on the um, verbal and nonverbal batteries of the COGAT. Ms. Barra talked earlier about COGATs used to qualify for Quest, and we use two of the three batteries to help students qualify for uh, critical inquiry. As I said, verbal and nonverbal. The nonverbal tells us how kids think, and the verbal tells us a lot about them as readers and decoders of text and users of language. So the COGAT is one measure that we look at, but we also look at other data points that we have to kind of give us a well-rounded picture. We do look at New York State ELA test scores. We do look at um, grades in students' classes. This year, for the first time, we're gonna be looking at the common assessments in writing at grade five. Uh, and that does provide us with a well-rounded picture of the student who will succeed in critical inquiry. So that addressed another question that was in my hand uh, in terms of why do students retest with a COGAT after Quest going into critical inquiry. And it's really because that COGAT test also factors in a math subtest. And, and we flesh that out and we look at just the, the uh, verbal and nonverbal because it is a reading course at, for critical inquiry. Um, here's a, a question saying, my child is in fifth grade in Quest and Accelerated. We're moving out of state. Who's the point of contact to get the information? Um, your, your child's current school will have his or her school records. You can also print off a report card for a receiving district. That's what we're looking for. We're looking some sort of proof that the child was in acceleration. And that actually leads to another question here that uh, the child is going to be entering Shen in grade eight coming from another district. Will he or she need to be assessed coming into the district for acceleration? I would say um, we typically look at the academic profile of the child coming in, depending on the program we may test, uh, but some of the, the points that Mrs. Sherwin outlined, uh, we can tell it. Perfect score in a New York State assessment and very high grades and it appears to have been in an enriched course, then it's not gonna be an issue in terms of going right into an honors course. So we're gonna look at the child's academic profile uh, as the child is moving in and make some decisions. And, and if we're not sure based on that, then there may well be some additional testing required. Um, how many and what colleges do you have articulation agreements with for <laughs> credit? Um, if you ask Mr. Flynn, he loves that, we, loves that we do this. He's our high school principal. He would say too many colleges. It, it's a whole lot to keep track of. Uh, we have, in fact, uh, one of the questions was, actually, Mrs. Barrow, would you mind pulling up the social studies progressions? Because some people have expressed interest and it's the one that I skipped over, that was my issue. Um, we, if you look at the social studies progression, we actually have an agreement with Syracuse University for um, a, a course for seniors, the SUPA course, which is a Syracuse psychology course. We have articulation agreements with uh, SUNY for sure, for SUNY Albany for multiple, in particular our world language. We have SUNY 1 and SUNY 2 for our four main world languages. We're offering most of those courses, although it does depend a little bit on enrollment in terms of whether or not we're running Latin or German at the upper SUNY levels. Certainly Hudson Valley. We have Siena College Physics. Um, what am I missing? Were there other colleges that I'm missing in terms of articulation agreement? So in terms of the social studies progressions, one of the questions came up, why AP world history, uh, why was that added at grade 10, and what about world cult world lit? 
So let me just take a moment and point out that accelerated students take that world cult world lit in grade nine. For students who don't and, and actually are interested in having that 10th grade and, and at the end of that take the Regents exam for global history. Some families, and we're seeing this, now knowing what's to come, and that's again another benefit of having these progressions documents up there, are actually preferring that their child take Global Nine Honors in ninth grade and then move into AP World in 10th grade. College Board, which is the same company that issues PSATs, SATs, and all AP courses, does not authorize allowing ninth graders to take AP courses. So that's why we have a little disconnect where some students who are accelerated go world cult, world lit in grade nine, and then because they have already shown their proficiency on the global regions, they flow into US history. It's going to be a decision point, if, especially if you have a child at home who's very interested in social studies. That's, that's going to be a family decision. I know it, we fall into kind of two camps here in Shen. Those who, uh, who all right, raise your hand if you took World Cult, World Lit when you were here. This is like, and I, oh, really, normally we have, I, I kid you not, years we've had 20 people in the audience who've taken World Cult, World Lit. It's like this iconic Shenandoah course. I mean, people stop me at soccer fields and talk to me about World Cult, World Lit. It's just that important to so many families. It's a wonderful course. And so if you are really interested in having your child have that experience, you tend to go that pathway, either, either on the acceleration pathway in grade nine or taking that World Cult, World Lit, particularly if you're really into the humanities side of global history, then you can take that in grade 10. If you are into accruing the AP designation and having a really high level of challenge, then you may consider that AP world history course instead. That helps accrue AP credits. And one thing I should know, we, we just met um, Dr. Robinson and Don Flint and myself, just met with uh, our local representative from College Board, uh, I guess it was yesterday. We have in Shenandoah more students than ever taking at least one AP course. And as we've increased the number of students taking AP courses, we've actually increased our percentages of students scoring threes, fours, and fives. We are actually, I think the rough number as of yesterday was 88% of our students taking AP courses are, are earning a three, four, five. So, I mean, you can't celebrate one without the other, but we've actually increased the numbers of students taking these courses and the passing rates of these courses, which is really, we're very proud of that. So that's gonna be a family decision in terms of whether you're going that world uh, history AP route or if you're going to go that world cult, world lit. Uh, typically, do families initiate acceleration or do the schools? I would say it's more common that schools, in it, the school initiates acceleration. Uh, we have built in mechanisms to screen through all of the students and all of the information we have that we use as important information points about students and we typically reach out to you and rec you know recommend that parents are welcome to say thanks but not at this time and sometimes that's the right answer because you know your pressures at home and you know your child and that's why we ask uh, and sometimes we've had people say I'd like to say thanks but no thanks but um, assuming continual progress, will the option still be on the table going forward? And, and of course, I mean, as you heard Mrs. Peverly say, we don't skip over grade six math anymore, but with the exception of that, they would just go into six honors and then they could take the compact in seven, eight. So there are always options on the horizon moving forward. And, and if you leave with nothing else, that's, that's a really important takeaway. One more. And sorry if I didn't get to your question. We will be here for uh, a, a good chunk of time after to answer your individual questions as needed. All right. Um, okay, yeah, this one. I think it was answered in a similar manner in terms of grade five accelerated math. Is it the same as the grade six? And that, that really is what the acceleration is. It's basically taking the next year's content and moving it down. <laughs> and, and typically it's taught more at an honors level with a little bit more depth. So. You would help us out tremendously if you could take time, and, and if you don't like doing it on your device, and I promise that survey is very short. It's like four or five questions. 
um, some open-ended feedback for us. We would love to hear from you. We'd love to hear what your questions are and when you'd like this information and, and does this format work for you, knowing that there are, in, in the spring, more specific uh, parent evenings if your child is invited to accelerate. So if your child is invited to participate in the Quest program, you would be notified and invited to a parent evening that would clearly outline that program. So we'd like to hear from you in terms of does this meet your needs and address most questions that you have, and we'll review that survey information. Thank you very much for coming out and, and sharing part of your evening with us. We hope this was somewhat informational for you and look forward to seeing you and thanks for allowing us to educate your children. We are here for questions.